Hello, I'm Toy Cat, and I am someone who lives in London who has gone all the way through the cyclist experience spectrum. I used to be someone who didn't ride a bike because I didn't have one and it seemed super dangerous, to someone who rode a bike but only in the super safest cycle lanes in the minimum uh, possible uh, opportunities. Then I used to be a moderately competent cyclist who could do cycle lanes, then bus lanes, then like maybe not very busy roads. And now I'm someone who, you know, look at these videos. I'm riding in all sorts of crazy situations in traffic, uh, like with the roundabout, like with uh, all sorts of the situations you've seen these videos and so I wanted to talk about bicycle instructor in London as someone who's seen all the various stages and what I think it's like now and maybe how it could improve so let's talk about real actual facts today shall we uh, but let's first hop on the bike and let's go somewhere and we're going to start by showing off what is, in my opinion, the holy grail of bike standards uh, for pretty much anywhere, which is fully segregated. I, there is the road, here is the people, there is lots of bumps in between to stop you from driving here. Fully segregated um, bike lanes with individual bike traffic lights. As you can see, there's not only a turning lane here for me to turn off if I want to turn left, as well as a, line, uh, you know, a lane to go forwards, there's also dedicated bicycle traffic lights. These actually go a few seconds earlier than regular cars to allow you to get out ahead of traffic. It's very, very smart. It's very, very clever. I like it a lot. This, um, There's even, on top of that, there are sometimes streets where cars can come at you this way. Uh, cars can't go this way, but you as a cyclist can. This isn't one of those, but it's a great example. Then we can move down from the gold standard to kind of the let's call it the silver standard where either there's a fully dedicated cycle lane which is big enough to have bikes and which cars don't need to intrude on just to do their basic tasks as a uh, vehicle and then there is what we're going to call the, the the tin standard the you know what we would like to do if we say we should make cycling infrastructure but basically don't want to and that is every now and then maybe paint a bicycle sign on the road not even dedicated uh, little bike boxes at the front here as you can see and instead just you are a car bikes are just cars with slower speeds and two wheels and here's the thing and now as someone who has ridden a bike in london for most of a year um and honestly like you know casually for like short trips by renting bikes um for a couple years before that um as someone uh, I, I can now ride all three pretty comfortably as long as i know what i'm in for and as long as the traffic isn't too busy, too aggressive, or too fast. Indeed, in most of central London, the speed limit is 20, which is roughly what you can do on a bike. Um, it's a little faster than the EU standard for e-bikes, but that's a whole separate point. But yeah, there is this perplexing uh, debate that I see, which I, I think is a little bit uh, misleading and maybe even uh, disingenuous, which is to say there's two things we should do. Either we should just accept, tell cyclists to ride on the roads because they are cars, or we need fully uh, gold standard infrastructure. We need full infrastructure that is just for bikes, like this little thing right here. This is fun, in my opinion. Look at this. Um, <laughs> we need fully dedicated bike infrastructure um, and nothing else will do. Uh, every single new street that is built needs to have gold standard or, you know, barring that silver plus plus standard, as close to gold standard as we humanly can, and we shouldn't accept anything less. And I see this as a great, you know, starting point if you want to get as many people as possible into cycling. When you're building new developments that have new roads, of course, yeah, try and make it uh, seem as though the ideal way in and out is cycling because there are so many great you know, benefits to people cycling and if you can nudge them towards that when you're building a brand new road, sure, that's a thing. Oh, look at this, by the way, the size of this cycle lane. Oh, no, it's not a lane, it's just... Okay, I'm down. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a regular lane with a bike symbol again to indicate that, like, yes, you can ride bikes here. The problem with that, by the way, the problem with these, like, lanes that say like yeah you can ride bikes here is they're implying you can't ride bikes over else it's not explicitly stated and anyone who knows the rules knows you can do it and anyone who knows cyclists know that they don't really need to follow the rules and it's not a big deal but um the point i'm trying to make with this video is that we don't need all full gold standard infrastructure what we do need though is we need more of it and that seems like a conflicting point how can you acquire more uh more infrastructure more uh stuff but also at the same time um okay see we're we're, we're heading into a 30 zone now. It's going to get a lot more dicey as a, as a bike rider right here. But yeah, I hold the controversial opinion, I think, that actually aiming for fully uh, dedicated, uh, fully separated grade bike infrastructure is probably not a smart target. And the reason I think that is because it's actually a very inefficient use of road space. This is, a, this, this is actually something that can be debated because what is efficient road you know, space usage? Would you say, that efficient road space usage is getting the most number of people transported in X amount of time, um, then a fully used cycle lane is the most efficient way to go. Except if you go a realistic cycle lane, 
usage estimates, which is that, yeah, most of the time, every cycle line you're gonna see in this video, I'm gonna be the only cyclist, or I'm gonna see one other guy. That's, oh wait, oh Christ, we're gonna go up here. <laughs> this is a terrible cycle lane design. It's not even a cycle lane, it's just, that it just tells me to go on the pavement. Um, every single piece of cycle infrastructure you're gonna to see today, it's gonna to be just me. Regardless of whether it's good, bad, ugly, pretty, useful, gold standard, still standard, um, every single bike infrastructure piece that you see today. Oh wait, here we go. This is a bus lane right here. And so as a bike, I can use the bus lane. A handy little feature, in my opinion. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm the only person using these, whereas you're gonna see a ton of cars overtaking me. So in terms of passenger movement right now, it's actually pretty inefficient. And so if you were to magically overnight replace everything, you would magically um, be reducing volumes by quite a bit until people adjust it. So in terms of right now traffic flow, not actually ideal. Uh, the only reason that it's considered to be more efficient is because you're pushing people towards riding bikes. Again, by sending the message that you, the car, are not wanted. Look at this, by the way. Two, this, all of this space here is for bikes and buses. That space there, that one lane, is for cars. Send the message to cars that you are an outlier, you are not the norm, you are the exception, and then you can push people into cycling. And I think that's a, I think that's a valuable thing to do, especially the closer you get to the center of a city anywhere in the world. You need to say, hey, we cannot have, you know, like eight million people all having their personal giant, what, like, what is the size of a car? Like three meters by two meters box that sits around, spews, spews uh, pollution into the atmosphere. That's not okay. Okay, here we go. We got like kind of good bike infrastructure right here. It's just, they took the pavement and they said, yeah, we'll, we'll paint bike symbols on it. It's the same thing. Um, but like, instead of making it less efficient for cars, making it less efficient for pedestrians. And who even cares about pedestrians? Are you a pedestrian? I'm not a pedestrian. I mean, I sometimes am, but let's pretend we're not, of course, uh, as people love to do. Oh, look at that, actually, I'm gonna go left. I'm gonna follow this right up here. Also proving a point about not being the only one in the cycle lane. Oh, look at this, so much utilization. <laughs> but um, yeah, so um, obviously efficiency is measured as whether you're trying to meet current demand or whether you're trying to push demand to where you want it. But also I feel like people miss the point of high quality bike infrastructure. It's not just a great target for the future. It's also a great thing for now. If you live somewhere along this bike path, if you live some, I, I, I live, um, <laughs> I, I live along quite a few bike paths. And um, it's the sort of thing that when you say it's this safe, you know that if I fall down right now, I'm not gonna have my head crushed by a car. I'm probably gonna hit it on this curb right here. I hope it's soft, but uh, <laughs> you know, my head is not gonna be crushed by a car and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get hit by a, a drunk driver or whatever ludicrous thing we're gonna try and imagine. And so anyone living in these apartments right here, which, wow, without knowing it, I, I did the exact thing I was trying to mention in this video, brand new cycle lane built for a brand new set of apartments. I'm assuming they're brand new because they've got that generic brick facade that fancy new builds have. And, uh, oh, is that actually the end of it? Was that the entirety of a cycle lane? It was, okay. But um, <laughs> when you're in a, um, if you see that you have a cycle lane near you, and it's super safe and you see it all the time when you're in the car or when you're walking with your legs like a filthy pedestrian, um, <laughs> you might then realize, oh, I'll give this cycling thing a try, shall I? Um, I'll put my legs up and down repeatedly and then I'll make some motion happen that will make, make me go places. And then you realize like, oh yeah, this was really fine, really safe, especially since it's so empty. But even if it's not, even when there's a ton of people on cycle lanes, which does sometimes happen, um, you're still gonna feel relatively safe and realize, oh, this was cool. I got to my destination and I exercised and I didn't have to find parking because it's a, <laughs> it's a city I live in, you know? I live in a, I live in a big city where the sh we don't need to, we don't have all this storage space for giant boxes. We barely have storage space for people, you know? Like you've seen the size of an average London uh, room. Actually, what is the size of the average London room? Let's throw that on, on the screen right here. I'd be willing to bet it's not much bigger than the space needed to park a car. Um, <laughs> so we could double the amount of space a person has if we eliminate the car. Or realistically, we could just double the number of people we fit in, <laughs> in the same space. But still, it's, it's more efficient either way. Um, and so, yeah, like that's, that's why you discourage people from using cars by making bike infrastructure good and making good bike infrastructure great like that. However, I think you want to that you don't need all bike infrastructure to be good. You just need some to be good. You need to have direct access to some very good bike infrastructure that doesn't take you straight into cars that don't seem to recognize you're there. I have the brightest front light in the world, by the way. Maybe it's so bright it's dazzling people. <laughs> Let's hope that's not true. But uh, whoa, look at the size of that plastic flying across the street. That is surreal. I'm gonna follow that now. Okay, that's not a bike lane. Look at that though. 
Anyway, um, <laughs> you know, like, honestly, when, once people have tried out the really good bike infrastructure where it's fully separate and you know you're fully safe, they'll be willing to try something like this street. This street that I'm on right now, it's dark. I have a bright light and a white jacket, but I'm still not sure that people will see me. I feel like someone will speed down here, knock me off, except no, nah, there's not really any cars to worry about. I, um, as someone who has cycled with many uh, people, you know, let's, let's be honest, girlfriends who are maybe um, very nervous about cycling because, you know, of the very imminent fear of your own mortality. Um, as someone who has cycled with a lot of individuals who are scared, people feel super safe on the, uh, on, on the, the things and that builds up their confidence that you can then use for a road like this. Because what scares people is potential conflict with other vehicles. That's true for car driving. It's true for bike driving, bike riding, I guess. And so look at this ro road right here. I've run into two cars so far, I think. And this is super chill. Now I'm getting used to bike infrastructure that looks like this. And I know that if I want to go somewhere, I can't take the most direct route because it's going to take me onto a, an A road, a major uh, thoroughfare, thoroughfare. It's going to take me onto a major uh, vehicle route. However, I can ride down the back streets. Like if I take a right turn right here, it's a one way street, but it's fine on my bike. I don't know if those are the rules, but we'll pretend it is. You know, I'm 100% I'm sure there's no vehicles on the street. And so it's effectively just a giant bike lane. You begin to realize that actually having those narrow dedicated things are great for the, for the major streets, sure. Okay, I happen to find a vehicle that happens to actually be turning in here, but it was after I left, so it doesn't count. I'm still right. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, like uh, you begin to realize that like, oh yeah, this is like a massive cycle lane. And sure, sometimes a big vehicle comes through it, but in the cycle lane, if you're in London, you gotta be, be aware that cars might come through the cycle lane too anyway. It happens all the time. I've got many pictures of uh, cars that just t make the wrong turn and end up in a cycle lane. And I almost made the same mistake myself despite having taken pictures off it, because sometimes it's easy to do that, okay? This is a weird, weird street run right here. See that, by the way, that road was closed to vehicle traffic, except for bikes. There we go, that's a simple way you can not spend all the money needed for new infrastructure, but still make something more friendly uh, to bikes and make people realize like, oh yeah, I've, I've run across four cars now in the entirety of this route and it's pretty chill. Like you have a really good time. You realize that you don't have to pedal to the metal because on a, on a road, you have to pedal at max speed basically or risk being hit. It's, <laughs> it's kind of scary sometimes if we're being honest, right? Um, on a road like this, we can go at five miles per hour. We can just leisurely rub the legs, rub the legs, uh, pedal the legs. And it's nice, we're seeing like a development or something. And we're still going places, right? We're still heading vaguely southeast, southwest um, right now. Um, let's just say south. Uh, we're still getting where we want to go. It's, it's, it's a leisurely form of transport, but there's no stress. There's no, oh my God, I'm literally going to die right this second if I'm not careful, which is great. I love not having the feeling of I will die right this second. And then once you do this enough, you begin to realize that like, okay, here is a major, major, major road. I don't know what the name of it is. Um, let, me, let me find out what it's called for you. Uh, okay, there's no sign saying it, but this is a major road. It's two lanes each way. Um, the speed limit was 30. I think it's just gone down to 20 here. Um, actually, this is a bus lane on this side. This is a really chill road. Oh, look at this. See, there's traffic lights for regular vehicles. No traffic lights for buses. Yeah, that's, that's what I call priority. Um, <laughs> But uh, I think oh, we're in Woolworth. I'm gonna guess this is Woolworth Road then. That's my, that's my high quality guess. There's, it looks like a generic British high street, but in the south of London. Anyway, as you can see, you start to get more confident riding on roads that are like kind of scary. This one's not scary as I was gonna say, but it's a better example actually. But like, yeah, it's now, now we're one lane thick. Cars want to go places. And so they'll start to overtake you. So you might start leaning to the left or riding on the left to allow cars that overtaking opportunity, right? Or, you, and, and then like, you know, you realize that like, okay, if I stay to the left, cars don't want to hit me. Cars have a very strong vested interest in not hitting me and like triggering whatever, you know, insurance payout comes from that. And honestly, um, the only real issues you run into is that like, yeah, this is a big city, so there are buses and those buses might hit me. Uh, in fact, every near miss I've had, I think has been with a bus. <laughs> including many in these videos. And then you begin to realize like, oh yeah, this is chill too. There isn't, like again, the speed limit's 20, you can make it 30 and it's probably gonna be roughly the same point. And it's like, oh yeah, there's basically no conflict opportunities if I ride full speed or if I ride to the left um, and it's a wide enough road, you know, or 
some combination of those two things. Uh, ride central lane at full speed. You're not holding anyone up. Riding a bus lane and you know that only buses can hit you. And uh, life starts to feel pretty good actually. It starts to feel like, oh yeah, I'll get a little pub. You can ride your bike to the pub and you can legally ride home. You actually can't legally ride home, but no one cares. So you can legally ride home as far as I'm concerned. Um, is that how laws work? Actually is, right? Actually is. Anyway, um, until it doesn't. That's how laws work until they don't work that way. Anyway, uh, as you can see, oh wait, okay. I missed the, oh God, there's a bus right behind me. Okay, let's, let's zoom up. Get stopped at a red light. Do I stop for the red light? I guess I do stop for the red light. Um, and you can realize that like actually, infrastructure for bikes is not that bad, even when it's terrible. As long as you have a few certain things in place, you can make great bike infrastructure that doesn't require resurfacing a road. All you have to do is make a lane, which is <laughs> have more bus lanes, which are basically bike lanes, but they're mega wide. Have more residential streets that cars can't be redirected through their sat navs. Um, if you do enough other things, you don't need to tear up <laughs> what you have already. I think um, sometimes we have this utopian view where you think, yeah, if you had unlimited money, what would you do? And sometimes that is great. I think at some point I should just go, right? I think at some point, yep. Yeah. Um, but we think like, if you had unlimited resources, how would you deal with a problem? And that's great. But you know the thing about the public world is, we don't have unlimited resources. Um, I think there is this, uh, there's a certain vein of thinking where it's like, oh yeah, I, um, I would like this quality of stuff. And the only way to get it is if everyone chips in a whole ton of money so we can have those nice things. And so let's just everyone chip in a ton of money so things can be perfect. But a lot of people might prefer the model of just, okay, let's get the best value for money. Let's have the nicest things we can that don't cost all of the money in the world. Oh, this is a nice little, little thing right here. I love the, like a brand new built apartment right next to like old council style. You're like, gentrified style restaurant there next to, you know, every UK, uh, British, Chinese restaurant. Uh, next to something called Golden Tea, actually. Is that bubble tea? Well, we have to find out. It does, it, I wouldn't imagine it is. And then there's Sabor Peruno International. So curious about all of this, actually. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I guess my, my basic point of this video is that bike infrastructure in London sounds terrible because we only have, uh, you know, like there's only 12 super highways or whatever. And then there's only, I think there's like a couple dozen quiet ways, which are like dedicated residential routes for cycling, but they're not really actually dedicated. They're just, they paint bike logos on the ground. And so you can use these if you want. Um, and by the way, out of the 12 dedicated cycle routes, which are grade separated, I'm on one right now. This is not grade separated. This is very much the opposite of whatever that is. I'm just on a road right now, as best I can tell. This isn't how infrastructure is meant to work. Yeah, this is, <laughs> I mean, I guess it's the best they could do. And by the best they could do, I mean, it's definitely not the best they could do. Um, I guess we're doing it anyway. Um, but yeah, you get the point that like, yeah, obviously we can do better and we need to have more major flagship routes. But the way the world actually works is we don't design a world that's all perfect all at once. We make as many perfect examples as we can. Okay, let's go to the left here and prove that non-dedicated routes are better than dedicated ones, even though that was not really that dedicated a route, it was just a lane on the side of the road. Um, oh, look how chill we can be again. Oh, isn't this nice? Um, ultimately, um, the way the world really works is we design the very best and we try it in some places and then we refine from the best and we put it in other places. And then for the remaining batch of stuff, um, a place is called Alberta Street. Fun, fun coincidence that it's the same as a Canadian province, or is it planned? Who knows for sure. But um, yeah, I, uh, oh look, there's even more of these right here. People, I think road drivers get really mad at these because they're like, I want to cut through residential areas. I'm so confused why I can't. I, <laughs> but um, the truth is, is like, and then for the rest of the things, for 90% of the world, we find a balance between cost and effectiveness that works for them. Um, you know, like, as an example, uh, what is the best phone right now? Is it the Galaxy Fold 3 or is it the iPhone 13? You probably think one of those two devices um, in terms of like just pure 
best of the best. Uh, what, what's the best money? Or is it the 13, the 14? Whatever, you, you think it's a phone somewhere, right? If we mandated that everyone should have these things, we're like, okay, we the government are gonna buy iPhone 14s for everyone. Think about the benefits it'll bring when everyone has brand new iPhones and it'll brand new, brand new Galaxy Gold, Samsung Galaxy Fold 3s. But it's like, well, now you're just, you know, because the government is everyone, you're forcing everyone to pay for phones. And sure, you're gonna do it in a proportional manner where, you know, those with more to pay, pay more. Those with less to pay, pay less. Um, but you're still forcing everyone, you know, the collective everyone. But yeah, my point of this video was to say that life is a balance. And even something like infrastructure, which is one of the best cases of spending because it lasts for not, it's not the same as buying everyone an iPhone, which is irrelevant in one year. They last, uh, infrastructure can last for 30 years, 50 years, 100 years. There are some pieces of infrastructure that have lasted well over 100 years. Um, and so um, there is this funny, if you forgive the word funny, uh, fact. They're like, yeah, actually it's different. And so we should do the best. But working out what our goals will be and working out how to balance with the world we want, with the world we actually have and we need to meet the demands for, is uh, something that's important, even with something I'm very passionate about. It's hard to say, when you love something, you're like, yeah, I just think the government should just do what I want all the time, you know? Um, you know, I just, I just have this feeling that it'd be better for everyone if I got exactly what I want right now. You know, I, I, it's just a feeling. I, actually, no, sorry, it's not a feeling, it's facts. I have explicit, okay, I'm gonna go, look at this. Oh, I went through on my Instagram. Do you, wanna, do you wanna see the picture? Follow me at Instagram at IBX Um Yeah, that's a solid, solid 16 of you watching the video at this point who are like, ooh, I've, I've just heard about Instagram for the first time. Did you know I post there once every six months? I think it's been more than six months since I last posted. You know how the pandemic is. <laughs> you don't have to do anything anymore. You just gotta say pandemic and then it's all good. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, then that's good. If you didn't, that's bad. But the most important, see, look at this, by the way. Nice cyclable street. It sends a message to, to cars to be like, hey, be careful here. It sends a message to pedestrians that you can walk on the road. It sends a message to cyclists. They're like, yeah, do whatever you want, man. Just just save that environment or get get into shape or whatever whatever your point is. This place looks good. Anyway, I um, hope you all enjoyed this video. I secretly regret not living in an elephant and castle now. Look how, look how nice this area is. And uh, I guess I'll see you all in the next video. Unless I don't. In which case, goodbye forever.